morning, everyone. Thank you for making the time to attend the first BCS FinSec event for the summer. My name is Chikeze Ekinyao. I'm the industry liaison officer and inclusion officer for the BCS FinSec group. I'm really excited about our topic of presentation for today and hearing from our guest speaker, Uzoma Waka, who we've lined up. I'll be starting off with a brief introduction of our speaker followed by his presentation. There'll be a Q&A session after the presentation. So please feel free to enter your questions into the Zoom Q&A chat function, which will be moderated by our committee member, David Lewis. Zomag Waka is a managing director at Jeffries. He has over 20 years of senior credit trading experience working for top tier US investment banks such as Goldman Sachs, and European investment banks such as BNP Paribas. Zoma is also a trustee for the Wonder Foundation. So I'm going to be handing you over to Zoma now to present his uh, topic. Thanks. Zoma, it's, it's time for you to. There we go. Uh, always talking about technology and then technology happens. Um, thank, thank, thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction, Chikizer. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here and, and have the opportunity to speak to the BCS and really, I guess, take you a little bit into my, my space, my world. As Chikizer said, I've been doing this for 20 years, over 20 years now. And the Cooper Bond market, I'd say, it's a space that's not massively understood by the general public and by, by even people within the finance industry. It seems to be one of those corners of the market. So I'm here slightly just to, I guess, sort of take off a little bit of mystique, but talk about it specifically with the lens, obviously, of technology and come to addressing that critical question, which is, you know, is technology disrupting this corner of the financial markets? I'd also just like to start by saying that I'm speaking on my behalf as Zoma in a personal capacity. Um, these, are my, these are my views, they're, they're not the views um, of my current employer or, or past employers. Um, and, you know, feel free to ask as, as, whatever questions you, you like at, at, at the end. Um, and I will try and obviously help you guys um, as, as much as possible. Also, I will be talking about different companies in this presentation. Again, I'm not endorsing any particular companies here. I'm just giving you a sense of who, you know, who, who's relevant in, in my world and who's doing what. So without further ado, let's, let's talk about corporate bonds. So you know, what are corporate bonds? I mean, that's the start. We all know about loans. We know about bank loans. Look, corporate bonds essentially are IOUs. That's what they are. A company comes, it lends, lends money to the buyer of the bond and says, we're legally you know, obliged to pay you an interest and pay you a principal at the end. That's usually how it works. Of course, with interest rates where they are, some of the interest is 0% on some corporate bonds, just to, just to put the context of where, where we are now. Um, I'm not going to be talking about things like ABS, um, which are asset-backed securities. I'm not going to be talking about inflation-protected securities. The fixed income market is very, very large. We're going to you know, stick with the corporate bond world. It can be bonds issued by banks, by the way, in financial industry, insurance companies, they also issue bonds, and those will be termed corporate bonds, but we're not going to really be looking at, you know, things like treasuries, for example, that's a whole different, um, you know, world in itself. Well, you know, how did corporate bonds come about? Let's move into that. Well, corporate bonds came about because, well, before they came about, you needed some, you needed people wanting to borrow. Now, you know, when people want to borrow, especially their sovereigns, you know, how do they do that? As far as I can remember, people have borrowed for a long, long time. But really, when it comes to what we would recognize as corporate bonds, we're probably going to the 1600s, and it probably came about in, in the Dutch Republic at the time. You had a situation there, often the case, sovereigns, principalities, princes and kings, they want to borrow money for, for, for war, um, for expansion reasons, or for, you know, just for fighting battles. Um, it, it was the same in, 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 you know, here, you had Dutch principalities which issued, let's call it quasi-sovereign uh, debt, 
But then you have the sort of legal structure came in place and you had a company, Vork, um, or a Dutch um, East India company who came out and issued shares uh, for the first time and issued bonds for the first time. Now that this was a retail product, um, people wanted it. Um, and I think this is interesting because at the very beginning, at the very heart of corporate bonds, you see back in the 1600s, you have a strong retail participation um, in that market. Of course, you know, interest in corporate bonds didn't stop there. I mean, it, it, it moved um, to, to various other countries. Of course, the UK, you had, you had the Bank of Bank of England came about, you had issued bonds, um, and then you had corporates uh, in the UK sort of issuing as you get into the 1700s. And, you know, you move through, fast forward, the new world, the, the USA come in, um, and then suddenly you've got a huge amount of, um, you know, knowledge about finance and, and certain, and certain uh, understanding of finance. Um, in the US, of course, it's expanding. You've got railway companies, you've got utility companies, and they need some form of financing. So in the 1900s, people knew what corporate bonds were. They were actually traded quite often um, on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and there were like smaller lots, retail participation, as I said, and what those early dealers would often do is that they'd aggregate um, you know, some of the, um, the volumes. They'd, they'd aggregate the smaller lots, get it together, and then give it to the institutions. The institutions could be depository institutions um, you know, who would need larger size. Um, so they, they'd be an example of someone who may look at corporate bonds. Now, look, in that time, obviously, what, you know, we're looking now in the sort of 20s, you, you have the depression begins to hit. There's a bit of volatility, as we know, in the market. And, Corporate bonds are not really spared. And what you find happens there is in that volatility, retail moves a little bit away from the market. So retail move away and, and the market becomes a lot more institutionalized with the dealers um, doing a lot more business with the larger institutions. So those are principally like the, you know, the insurance and, and, and insurance groups and the lifers. Um, they are the ones who are sort of getting involved. Um, and a lot of that trading continues um, and that market is all well and, well and good, but you get sort of towards the late 70s um, and inflation begins to take off. So volatility comes back into the market. Um, you get a little bit more yield again. Retail participation comes up. But I think what's interesting when you're getting towards sort of hitting towards 1980, and I think this, was very, this is very, very important to understand, is that, you know, you're getting the computers are beginning to hit now, the sort of, you know, the bond calculators. And so, you know, we're really talking about... Um, you know, a space that requires some kind of quantitative, quantitative computation here. Um, you know, fixed income product itself, you know, working out, you know, what is the yield to maturity on the bond? You know, what does that actually mean? And so as the sort of computers come in, you get a lot of innovation in that space. And you begin to get like the first asset-backed securities being in invented. That's when you hear about like the best Stearns, you know, Salomon Brothers, et cetera, sort of coming in and bringing real novel products to the corporate bond market. But I really want to mention that and stress this because, you know, one of the, the, the big kind of, I guess, growth and the real kind of interest, and especially in the junk bond market in particular, um, it, it was allowed because, in some sense, technology sort of moved in and, and helped with, with that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're now, I'd say, in present day corporate bond space where effectively, you know, what is the structure of this market? It, in many ways, it hasn't sort of changed. You have... Um, institutional clients or retail clients who want to buy or sell um, these corporate bonds. Um, you have principally dealers who are usually affiliated to banks. They will use inventory. I mean, they have, well, they'll use their balance sheets. Um, you know, they have inventory. They'll facilitate that business. Uh, and, and generally, that's, that's, that's the market. It's, uh, you know, you ask, you ask dealers for prices. Dealers give prices and, and you trade. And that's how the full bond market has really has, has really worked. Yeah, you know, that hasn't that that has not changed in principle. So it's very important that you understand that this isn't like a market which is sort of order driven. Like you know, you have orders come into some kind of exchange, and you know you, you get the tightest price, and then you sort of trade off, trade off that exchange. Well, as we'll see, that's a small part of the market, but that's not principle. This market is this market. You know, very much remains one where you know, dealers provide liquidity to, to, to the users of, of the product um, by, by showing prices or indications of prices and cares. Now, look, it's, it's a big market. 
the whole debt market is massive. I mean, we're talking about, um, I think when I looked at this, it, the, the whole of the bond markets uh, are about over 100, so over 100 trillion in size. Um, so they're actually even slightly bigger than, than, than the equity market. It's a big, big market, but a big part of that market is of course, treasury, treasury market. But for corporate bonds, like we're talking about like, you know, maybe 10 trillion of like US corporate debt, for example, and maybe, you know, similar size in terms of European corporate debt. So, you know, these are big sizable markets, but in terms of how they trade and corporate bonds in particular, I mean, corporate bonds are not trading at the same volumes that like your know, equity markets are, are, are trading. Corporate bonds do trade certainly with less frequency. Um, and also even when you take into account the slightly bigger notional of the market, it, 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 does, it then does look large, but corporate bonds, you know, they may trade four times or five times less than the treasury market, which is, as I've said, like a big, big, big market. So, you know, the corporate bond market, more or less, it's understood to be a market that is quite, in many ways, just not a liquid market. If it's a market, it's, um, you know, people want it to be more liquid. There's a lot of chatter about it being more liquid, but recently, um, you know, bonds just don't trade. Bonds that traced in the US, uh, I think less than 10% of those, less than 10% of those, or around 10% around of those didn't trade in a particular year. I think if you look in Europe and you look at the entire corporate bond space in Europe, um, and you look at private debt as well, and everything that's av available to trade, I think you have like 20, 30% of bonds, which are just not trading. Um, and so, you know, this is a really low, li you know, low liquidity market. Who's, like, who's involved in this market? It is those same guys, like I spoke about. It's, it's, it's those, you know, it's those insurance companies. It's, it's, you've got a concentration, I'd say, of quite large players in, in this market. You've got pension funds, yeah, you've got insurance companies, you've got asset managers, of course, who come in. Hedge funds are a big part of the market. Banks, central banks in Europe, we know, you know, that's a big part of the market as well now, um, you know, with the ECB and the CSPPP program. Um, so you've got big institutions in, in, in this market. A part of it is to do the sort of minimum denomination. Like a lot of corporate bonds, the minimum ticket size you can do is 100,000, right? Whereas on shares, you can, you can trade a, a tiny odd lot. So look, I'd say, the sort of takeaway from, 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 this, from this market, and what, what I want you to understand is that in many ways, the market hasn't changed that much in the last like 100, 150 years, dominated by big, big players in, in the market, which then kind of makes the flows very lumpy um, to, you know, to, to some degree. And then of course, then when it comes to liquidity, a lot of that liquidity provision is still provided uh, by, by dealers who, essentially give immediate price and ex, you know, extend out the balance sheet to give immediate, to immediate pricing. I, will, I briefly want to quickly say, talk a little bit about regulation because regulation is important. Now, regulation came in, um, you know, Mifid II is something which came in in 2018 and it, it really kind of just meant that there was a sort of increase in transparency. I mean, that's the idea, the increases in sort of transparency, best execution, sort of things around that, sort of mapping out a little bit the market. Um, you know, that was something which meant that there was pre-trade transparency, post-trade transparency, and with that, and, you know, coupled with, let's say, with the US, with their sort of trace that they've had since 2002, you suddenly have a situation where there's just a lot more visibility, let's say, in where these illiquid bonds are trading. That's important, as we're going to see, because that's allowed and continues to allow a lot of the technological development we're seeing in the market is only being able to happen because we're now being able to see more clearly where instruments are trading. Of course, we've got to be careful because, um, and this is, you know, this, is a, this is a live topic of discussion, you know, too much print and too much, let's say transparency in pricing can actually hurt customers who are trying to deal on, 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 on larger tickets. But the, the change of regulation as well, and I'll quickly mention also that um, I think is very important here, was after the financial crisis, okay? Banks had been extending a lot of liquidity. After the financial crisis, you had the Volcker rule came in, which basically meant the banks weren't, had to sort of rein back their proprietary trading. Um, and they had to, you know, really be true market makers and distributing the, the, the risk in this sense, in, in as much as they can. Um, so that was very important. And then of course the cost, 
just the actual cost. So we're looking at things like Basel uh, three. So the actual cost of banks holding inventory went up. So what you've seen is that inventory of banks has gone down. Um, I think it's around maybe even quarter the size as it was at the, at the height, uh, you know, pre-2008. So, so dealers' inventories come down, but the actual size of the corporate bond market has gone up, like sticking to the US, because that's the largest bond market in the world. US corporate bond market was maybe 5 trillion in size, going back to 2007 and eight, it's now like 10 trillion in size. So it's doubled in size, balance sheets have come down. Again, I mentioned this, this is, a regu this is caused by regulation. And what that means is that the market, the microstructure of the market, the participants in the market have to find out new, innovative, clever ways in order to sort of find new ways of, let's say, using the information, the data, and, and basically getting liquidity. Now, when we talk about technology within the core bond market, we all think of electronic trading. I just want to start by saying electronic trading itself is probably no more than 30% um, of, of, of the market. Um, you know, corporate bond market is still very much an OTC market. Um, in terms of, let's say, exchange and off-exchange off exchange, uh, in, in Europe, the last figure said that 85% of uh, corporate bond trading was happening away from exchanges. Now, look, by exchanges, I mean regulated markets. I, I mean things like the LSE, Deutsche Börse, that type of thing. But I also mean um, you know, things like, um, things like the multilateral trading facilities. Um, so like electronic kind of venues like this, um, only around 15% sort of trades through that. So it's still very much a sort of negotiated market, um, you know, where the customers interact very much with dealing community and make use of that liquidity that the dealers can do. But if you can imagine, if you're a client and you want to ask a lot of dealers prices, well, here comes in the RFQ market. RFQ market has exploded. Uh, that is request for, for quotation. Uh, that is, you know, that's you know, dominated by three main players at the moment, by Bloomberg, by Market Access, um, by TradeWeb. And, you know, clients will come in, they can ask 16, 20, 25 dealers, whoever, ask for a price, and then the dealers will just respond automatically. So that's been a big, I'd say, sort of move in my market. Then I, I speak here a little bit about matching sort of platforms and aggregators. They all do slightly different things. Matching platforms... You know, they're going to say, look, we're going to create liquidity by either saying we believe we know where the mid is and we're going to show interest and we're all going to try and trade around that mid. Um, or even some of them are trying to do things. And by the way, that can be between dealers or between clients. So client to client or dealer to dealer. Um, you know, or we're going to say we kind of know where the mid is and we're going to even try and open up a little bit of negotiation around that. So, you know, there's a few guys that have opened up I'd say around that. And that's, um, you know, that's been an evolution, an interesting thing in, in our market. True mid is, I'd say, is an example of that. You know, liquid, liquid network would be another one. Um, you know, the, the, the aggregators, what they do is they basically take data, right? And they say, banks, you know, you have all this inventory. We're going to help you advertise that inventory in a good way to your clients, right? You've got a bond. You want to sell that bond. Let's, let's make sure your clients know that you, you have that bond. So that's where you have the birth of companies like Neptune, for example, uh, you know, which is a good example of, of a company that does that. Um, you've got a company called Algamy, who's another one to do this kind of thing. So a lot of technology behind that, and that's really kind of helped the market move in that way. Then you've got interdealer brokers. They've moved a little bit into some of these other markets that I've sort of mentioned before, but principally interdealer broker markets will still act between the dealers because of course as we've said many times now dealers principally are the ones who provide the liquidity um, into this market um and then it's like you sort of move i'd say into uh you know i look here a little bit into the um ET etfs but actually no let's before we talk ETFs, let's go back to the retail platforms because i think that's important so a lot of you will be thinking well what's happening with retail in all of this well, retail can ask dealers, but it's very hard for them to get the liquidity that they're looking for from dealers. So you do have, you know, exchanges, as I said, you, you can trade corporate bonds on exchange, but it's a tiny fraction, like true, true exchanges, zero point something percent, I'd say, like, in terms of the flows. Like, it's, it's, it's really, really, really small. Um, but there are other guys kind of coming in. It's like, you know, there's a company called, um, there's a company called UBS Bondport, for example, which, um, you know, where retail guys can put small lots on and 
things can trade around that. So, you know, there, there are, I'd say, sort of little solutions coming up. And in some way, those are sort of catering for sort of, I'd say, the odd lot, smaller size, um, smaller size tickets. Um, ETF and portfolio trading, very, very important when it comes to technology here. ETFs, we all know what that means on the equity side of the business, but we do have bond ETFs and they have exploded. Uh, the bond ETF market is now over a trillion in size. I mean, this thing was probably less than 10 billion, not, not so long ago, like a decade ago. So it's really been like exponential kind of growth. And, and, and as you can think, with the ETFs and the liquidity that those provide, then that adds another source of liquidity into trading the underlying. So what you've had is that you've had some extra flow getting generated by the creation of the ETFs. The technology has allowed ETFs to exist, right? Because if you've got a whole portfolio of lots of bonds, like trying to, let's say, create and redeem baskets, try and change in the constituents, um, you know, you need to do a lot of trades at the same time. And you do need the platforms that I've discussed previously to sort of help with those trades. So as the platforms themselves and these trading venues become better what they do, you know, what happens then is that you can get like, you know, big portfolio trading. So that's companies, will, you know, clients will come in and they want to rebalance various sectors. They can just quickly buy or sell, um, you know, at speed and can just put that down the platform very quickly and the dealers can just price. So a lot of this has come about, um, you know, via via the technology. Now, look, I then talk here a little bit about connectivity, execution, uh, order management systems and reporting and compliance. Why is this important? Well, well, this is important because at the end of the day, if you've got a whole bunch of all different kind of technology firms, banks, brokers, all of people like interconnecting with this corporate bond market, everyone needs to connect, right? So technology has been really good for making all of these different parts connect. And you've got some great companies out there, you know, who really help both the clients and the banks you know, sort of order all of this workflow, all this execution flow, and make it very streamlined, and also help with the compliance. You know, we spoke about regulation. It's very important that if you have to report a trade, it's reported. So again, the technology is there and helping all these things happen. And that's exactly the same, by the way, when it comes to processing, trade clearing, you know, settling of trades, STP, standard, you know, um, trade processing, straight through trade processing, sorry, that was a big thing in, in well, bond market and actually the derivative markets because, you know, in the old days, you can imagine when I did a trade of a broker, I had to sit there and manually book the trade. And then that would distract me from getting on and pricing the next trade. But now, you know, you click the trade, then just washes through, you know, with, with, without that, just that initial touch from me. So it may seem like a small point, but it's things like this is what adds more liquidity, makes it easier for. Um, you know, for everyone to trade and people to access the market. Analytics, I think this is very important. At the end of the day, it's, you know, we're becoming a lot more sophisticated as an industry. And I say this as a financial industry as a whole, where we understand that, you know, can we in some way think about the decisions we make and, you know, analyze it, you know, in, in, in a more exact manner, let's say. Um, and that's where analytics comes in, okay? So also, if I've got a portfolio and I want to manage my risk in that portfolio, do I truly understand all the different levels of risk I have in this portfolio? How can I slice and dice that portfolio into lots of little bits of risk that I can understand? You know, software companies are really coming through. Some of the existing players are obviously um, selling um, and uh, you know, offering suites to, to customers, whether that's sell side or buy side. Um, and really helping, you know, with the risk management process, helping with the execution process, you know, are we getting best price? Well, not so much are we getting best price, but, you know, can we see versus what we believe mid is, how much we're paying as a client to execute trades? Can we kind of track that? So, so execution and, and uh, you know, and analytics around that. Market data, you know, we're in a liquid market like, like the corporate bond market. It's very important to know, like, you know, where, how things, you know, where things trade and, you know, what are the historical prices? How, how do we get that? And what you'll find is that a lot of these platforms, which are involved in the trading of corporate bonds, you know, they obviously have, have data and they'll find you know, ways to use that data, package that data back to the users as well. Um, I just give, just give an example of what I mean by that. You have, um, you have Bloomberg, for example, there's a composite known as CBBT. 
Um, and really that's a composite of dealer prices. So dealers are streaming prices to Bloomberg and then they can kind of take a composite. And in some way, you know, the market looks at that, um, that composite and it does mean something to the market. So look, analytics around market data, that is something which is, uh, which will continue to grow. And I think as more and more uh, you know, companies have access to sort of real-time data, then there's gonna be a whole bunch of analytics on around that. I just very briefly talk about the primary markets here. Um, I'm a trader. That's what I've done from the very start. Um, and, but the primary markets is what happens before I trade the bonds. So when a company actually wants to issue, well, when a company wants to borrow rather, um, you know, they will go to syndicate. The bonds will then get effectively distributed to the, the first buyers, the, those who want the bonds. And it's only after those initial buyers sell on the bonds to other buyers, you get the secondary markets. Now, the primary markets themselves, technology is really, you know, making an impact in that market too. It's a market where, if you can imagine, there's a lot of error that can happen, a lot of error. If you're aggregating customer orders as a salesperson at a bank, you're, you're aggregating all these orders, you know, you can make an error, human error. So if you can somehow make it a little bit more automated, um, you know, the whole process of, of, of book building, then that's a win-win for the, for the issuer. It's a win-win, obviously, for the banks, and it's also you know, a win-win for all the clients. So everyone is, is happy there. Now, let's look at the latest technological in innovations in, in our market. I put four things here, and I think what's important for you to understand here is that all, all of these areas are really just exploding right now. We want to start by looking at algorithms, okay? Algorithmic trading. Banks, as dealers, responding to prices coming in. I would say 10 years ago, no bank had an algorithm responding. So every single ticket, whether it was, uh, you know, a 100K ticket or whether it was a 50 million block, it, it would require, it require a human person to, to go and price that. Now, you can imagine now... It's it's almost it's almost impossible, um, you know. So with the with the portfolio trades, the ETFs and stuff. So increasingly, a lot of banks have got algorithms, which which will price back. I talk about advanced algorithms because I think that's in some way the, the next level alg algorithm. Those are you know just smarter algorithms. Um, you are you definitely have like in other markets, you have alternative liquidity providers sort of you know stepping into the market um, with, with their with their own algorithms and their own ways um, of, of of doing business. Um, and I look, I expect that's a trend that's that's going to continue. And technology, as it gets more sophisticated and better, is going to be a real important part in driving that. Then I talk about here a little bit, I look at the uh, digitalization. And what do I mean by that? For me, digitalization is really, I can kind of trade on my on my product, be it like a mobile, let's say a mobile phone. I can trade now, bang, clicking a few buttons. Everything is kind of connected in the sense it's, it's all online. I don't have to speak to anybody. I can just trade like that. Look, digitalizations happen in many ways. Like what I would say that what, to me, one, um, <laughs> and this is how I understand digitalization, a lot of communication used to be done on the phones. Now a lot of it is done in chat rooms, right? So really we've kind of moved a little bit over there. Um, another, another example of digitalization, I'd say, is fractional bonds. Okay, we've talked about retail people in the market. Re, you know, it's like you want to, let's say you don't want to buy 100,000 of a bond, but you only want to buy 1,000 euros, pounds, or dollars of a bond. Is there a way you can break up these larger bond units into smaller units like fractionalized bonds? That's a form of digitalization. That is, you know, some companies have began sort of, well, not began. I mean, they are doing work around that and they're offering product, um, sort of fractional bond product. Um, to retail investors. So that's not a form of digitalization. But really, my understanding of digitalization is, you know, you can just basically go through the whole bond, the, the whole bond trading process can happen without your human being uh, really being involved um, in, in, in an obvious way. So we're, we're, still, we're still a long way away from that. You can imagine, you know, there are some companies who are sort of pushing in different areas and different, I guess, along the entire chain, different aspects of that chain of trading. Um, but, you know, that's one area that I see uh, technology continue to evolve. Then I talk here about AI solutions for investment decisions, risk management. We touched a bit on that on the last slide. Um, I definitely you know, have noticed, and I, and I think it will continue, 
but there will be more uh, software and technology companies who say, look, you know, we're going to help you, the buy side or the sell side, with your investment decisions and your and your risk management processes. Um, and you know, these these solutions, I, I say AI solutions. I know AI can be a bit of a buzzy word, but I say that because in some sense, some of them are trying to be true AI. It's trying to be true, like really, you know, we're using cutting edge, um, you know, computational methods and we're going to try and help you make the decisions. So that's happening, um, you know, a little bit in our market, but that's happening, I think, across the whole financial market. And then blockchain. Blockchain is an interesting one um, because uh, it, it's interesting. You would think the corporate bond market and you would maybe think that the whole distributed ledger technology may not have touched our market yet. It has. And the reason it has is because if you think about what blockchain offers, it, it, it offers a lot of things, but a lot of a lot of participants in the market, like some of in the market, it's about information, it's about what happens with that information, it's about protecting that information, it's about tracking trades that happen and making sure we can we, we, we can really make sure we know who holds the bonds and tracking the transactions. You know, this sounds a little bit like you know the the, the world of blockchain. And so of course you have tech on technologies that have now um, entered into the market and and are, and are, and are offering uh, you know, product, you know, for example, that would say, you know, look, all of the information you give us in this particular platform, you know, we, we can't even see it, right? It's totally, totally protected, it's encrypted. So that is there and that's meant to, you know, and that does sort of give some comfort, I guess, to some users of the market. Um, of course, we know that there are digital bonds. Um, that's a very recent development. I think the first digital bond probably came about about four years ago or something like this. Um, EIB were, were the latest big name to issue a digital bond. Um, look, I'm not going to necessarily speculate exactly like you know how how long it's going to go or, or where this is going to go, but there definitely does seem generally, in, I guess, in finance as a whole, you know, there's definitely some people are, who can see the benefits um, of having sort of true digitalization in some sense blockchain is a form of digitalization too so um you know if that does move then i think corporate bonds will also end up sort of moving with that and, and other types of bonds so i'm just going to finish by uh looking at you know the, the role of technology uh, in the future corporate bond market and i think it's i think it's important to understand that technology has been there from the start if technology has been there from the start you know, technology is going to be there in the future. It's like, and why is technology there? It's there because we don't have a market that is yet fully efficient. What, what, what do I mean by that? I mean a market in which um, yeah, in, information comes into the market, the, the prices re react, you know, almost like straight away with that information. That, that's a you know, cool bond market. Prices can react. It's, it's, you know, it can take time. The market yet is not efficient. It's not totally efficient. And I think while markets are not totally efficient, um, there's always room for technology to, to help in that. Is there a way, you know, you can somehow, you know, read that information, the data that comes in as a trader? Is there a way you can get that information and somehow already, you know, begin to sort of use that and adjust prices or, or, or do whatever you need to do? And that way, that will sort of make the markets more efficient. You only also have to look at the ETFs that I was talking about. At the end of the day, you know, ETFs, there's a fair value. The corporate bonds trade with a value and the ETF trades with a value. So why is the ETFs can trade with huge discounts or they can trade extre extremely rich? Uh, you know, this happens in a lot of markets. The point is the markets are not efficient and, and while the, the arbitrages are not being met, whether that's having more, more, I guess, efficient repo markets, and there's a lot of technology needed behind that, having more efficient CDS, credit default swap markets, which is also a tool um, that you know one can use to hedge corporate bonds. Like until you have the technology making these markets more liquid, more efficient, then I think there's always going to be room for technology. Connectivity, of course, connectivity is very important. Why? What, what do I mean by that? I mean that if you want to connect with the corporate bond market, you have to be able to connect with the corporate bond market. Are we in a situation now where anyone who wants to trade corporate bonds can trade a corporate bond of any size, of any currency, of any type? I'm not convinced with that, you know? So it's like, until everyone's connected to the market, there's a, there's a role for technology. 
It really is what there's a role for technology there. Liquidity, that kind of feeds in slightly to what I've, I've been discussing with in terms of market efficiency and connectivity. Yeah, the, 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 the corporate market is an illiquid market. Um, I, I keep stressing this because I think some of the, uh, some mistake that's often made in approaching the corporate market is trying to look at it like an equity market and just saying, well, this works in equities. Let's just do the same in corporate bonds. It, it, it doesn't really work like that. It's, so I think, you know, any technology that can make our market more, more liquid helps. Client to client is a big deal, as in a market which was very traditionally, still is very traditionally a client dealer uh, market. You know, it, it is good that you have in some way, you know, platforms and technology around there that, you know, allows small pockets, you know, of liquidity where clients do interact with, with other, and deal with other clients. Um, you know, what I would say with that is that what dealers offer, and I think this is important to really understand, is they offer the immediacy of trade. If you want to trade now at a size, then what's the price? And that's really what dealers do. And I think it's like, and often you're not going to have clients who are going to have the offsetting exact size of that particular bond at the other side. So, you know, technology still will have a role for improving the, the liquidity of our, mar our market such that, you know, larger tickets and larger size doesn't disturb necessarily the, the, the price in the market. And look, I, in some way, um, put this whole sort of umbrella of artificial intelligence. Why I put it there because, um, well, because it is so important. It's like a lot of financial markets. It's not really about rules programming something and saying, "Well, here's the rules, get on with it." It's <laughs> you know, it's about. I think there is definitely this kind of understanding that actually is about trying to maybe you know have a look at the data. We're now in a world where there's more data. There's more corporate. Yeah, you know, there's more data on corporate bonds. There's more data. The financial instruments yeah can we in some way sort of infer the rules and i think look i mean our, our market in that sense is 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 um it's going to be very much influenced uh, both on the trading side which is obviously my field but um but also um portfolio managers um on on, on, on the buy side you know decision making process artificial intelligence has something to say for that and of course and i think i'm going to finish with this regulation you, I spoke a little bit at the start of this presentation about how regulation in some way you know, may, didn't make a big change to our, to our market. It, it caused some of the um, you know, changes in terms of liquidity provision in, in our market. Um, it also opened up some of the data that came into our market. Regulation will change in the future too. And I think you know, as that regulation changes, technology will always be a part of the solution. Now, look, I know that half an hour it's a very short. It's a very short time to go through um, an, an entire market, especially a market of this size and this importance. But um, but I'll be very you know, happy to take as many questions as I can in the time I have available to you. Um, but I hope that just helped you get a little bit of a flavour for what's happening now in our space. And to answer the question, is this, is is technology therefore disrupting the market? I hope you can see that. You know, my answer to that would say that. Technology is augmenting our market. Um, a lot of companies, it's almost like an enabler of our, our market. A lot of the incumbents in the market, you know, be on the buy side or sell side, are investing in their own, tech, their own in, in technology. There's also a lot of sort of mergers and companies are getting bought within the market. The incumbents are buying some, some of the newer companies. So I, I, I think it would be maybe too strong, <laughs> um, you know, to sort of use uh, that disruption term. Um, I'd say rather um, you know, the market is reinventing itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation, Ozoma. Um, I see we've got a couple of questions. I think uh, we'll hand you over now um, to David Lewis, uh, who's a committee member. He'll be taking the questions uh, from the audience. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ozoma. Very good uh, meet, you know, discussion, and I think very broad ranging, very quickly. So. Yes, we've got some audience questions, but for, as well as that, I'd like to ask you a few of my own. So take a, let's, let's start with the audience ones, which are the easiest ones perhaps to deal with. Um, you mentioned that technology in its own way was in a way a, a driver of liquidity um, because having availability about visibility on the marketplace, the size of the marketplace, like <clears throat> that's coming from technology. But there's, there's a lot of other liquidity factors, aren't there? 
other than simply technology? Can you just outline some of the other things that are driving liquidity? Because we, we heard a lot about dark pools at one stage. I remember there used to be very excited about dark pools. But that seems to have gone away. We're not talking about dark pools anymore. We can see the dark pools, can we not? Yeah, I mean, in terms of what drives the liquidity in the corporate bond market. So, okay, so I'll give you that. I mean, there's so many answers. There. So I'll give you an example of, of something that has sort of changed, let's say, slightly structural in Europe with the central bank. So we've obviously had um, a, a situation where very low interest rates um, and we've had inflation sort of missing the targets now. And so the ECB have come out and they said, we're going to do quantitative easing and we're going to buy corporate bonds. They're actually going to target the very area that I trade. Now, if you can kind of think about it, if you have a big buyer in the market, then you can see what that's going to do to offered side liquidity. It's going to make offered side liquidity thinner. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't matter what technology you have out there, your offered side liquidity is going to be thinner than it was before. Um, so that's just an example, I'd say, of something you know, which, which can affect liquidity. Another thing that affects liquidity is the uh, is when you look at a particular market, just how many different actors are in that market. So how it's kind of concentrated, like the biggest players, how big are they and the smaller players, how smaller are they? And I think with the equity market, what you have is that you just have a lot, you just have a lot of small players trading a lot of tickets. Like uh, whereas corporate bonds, you just don't have that. You, it is dominated still by sort of large institutional players. So that in some way will also control some level of liquidity in the market. And then that does affect some of the liquidity on some of the smaller tickets, for sure, by the way. Um, you know, you sometimes do have this situation where liquidity on small tickets, you know, can often be very difficult because when you're trying to find someone to offset the other side of a small ticket, you just may not have that interest. So, yeah. you know, whereas you have a bigger size, you can get an institutional trade can take place. So, you, you know, you get this kind of inverse situation happening, you know, there. So that's just another example. Bigger can be better and more flexible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, understood. Um, one, of, one of our participants was asking that aren't all bonds digital now? Um, <laughs> in as much as I remember when I was at European Banking Company, you know, we used to go to the vault and there'd be great rolls of paper, physical bonds that we would be passing around. Um, those <laughs> days have gone, I suppose, but uh, still custodians recording a record behind that. There will be some sort of physical document for some of these bonds, won't there? Am yeah, right? still some. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. So that's still that's, that's still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Still recorded digitally. Exactly. So how far how far do we talk about something being di like di digital and you know truly uh, truly truly digital? No, you're, you're absolutely right. But look, when you think about, aren't looking at what looking at that discussion. Let's talk about just cash, right? I mean, more and more, it's cash digital. But yes, to some degree, cash is digital. But we're still talking about potential. Um, you know, central banks issuing digital currency and uh, d d digital coins. So I think there's just different degrees of being digital. Okay, understood. Okay. Um, I remember lending and borrowing of securities becoming fashionable within my lifetime. Um, there was a matter, you know, that you didn't actually have to own the bond or the, or the, the bond to, to be able to trade it. To what how much of a key factor in the marketplace is lending and borrowing of securities you don't actually own at any time? So I'd say that when it comes to the corporate bond market, it, it's a key aspect of what we do. Um, when I say we now, I'm talking on behalf of, let's say, dealers, traders who are providing liquidity into the market. A big aspect of what you do is, of course, having to provide um, offers on bonds that, that one doesn't own. Um, and it, it is, it's, it's, it's an extremely important part of the market. It is a big market, by the way. The, the, the repo market is a very, very big market. Um, and it, it's, it's an important market that the, that the um, you know, the regulators um, you know, who, look at the you know, who look at the financial uh, markets, they're very interested in the smooth functioning of that market. Because there is also an understanding that, you know, you, you need participants in the market who are able to take an opposing view who and, and you know fine if you're a hedge fund you want to go short you do need people to have the ability to say i think this price is incorrect i want to short it that adds again talking about liquidity that adds a liquidity to the market and from a dealer perspective if dealers are not able to really have good repo that's an issue i would say probably from look in terms of how i have seen the repo market the repo the repo market is 
it's okay. It's I'm going to say it's okay. Um, it, and that there's still there's still space for it to 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 to, to get better. I I would definitely say that. You know, part of that market is you need to find people who want to engage with that market, people who want to lend bonds at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, that is... I can say that it gives you a way of making a greater earning, hopefully, from your bond holdings. I mean, the, you've got, if you've got a passive bond holding, it's, not, it's just paying your coupon or something. You can make a little bit more by letting That's exactly it... it. Yeah, yeah, you can, you know, you do your calculations, you can augment your carry in this sense on a bond. If you know you're not looking to actively trade that bond on a day-to-day -day basis, then you, you know, why not lock in a repo for some, for some term um, rather than just necessarily doing just overnight repos. So it's, it's something which you know, certainly all, all banks who are in the business of market making will, will, will be you know, sort of finding ways to expand how they can source, as it were, bonds um, and portfolios of bonds. Um, you know, that's very, very important, that's very crucial. And um, even the central banks themselves, you know, when they own bonds, they will also partake in a repo market. So they will also lend bonds. Good. Thank you. I, I think one of my jobs is to obviously reflect the questions we're getting from the participants. And I've got one here from a guy who's known as George. Hello, hello George. Uh, thank you for your question. He's particularly interested to know, like all big events, you know, we had the big crash in 2008. It affected how the market worked. We've now had COVID for the best part of two years, people working from home for long periods. How do you think the post-COVID market will be different from the pre-COVID market, if at all? Hmm. That's, that's a very interesting question, yeah. So, that's yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. So, I would, <laughs> yeah. so look, I'd, I'd, say, I'd say that what, what COVID has done in terms of corporate bond space itself, I'd say that because a big aspect of a market um, is still, let's call it quite traditional in the sense that, you know, there is a relationship aspect. There's a trust aspect. We remember when, you know, we, um, you know, as, as, as like you're currently, you know, as, as dealers, as banks, you know, they have a care of duty to execute for their customers. If they have information from the customers they want to execute by, by a block or, or some large block, you know, the client has to trust and really sort of trust that you know, the, the bank will look after that information, right? So it's like, it, 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 there is definitely um, a relationship aspect of it. And I'd say sort of pre-COVID, um, it, 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 building those relationships face-to-face -face in some way were very, very crucial. COVID happened, you, you, could, you could have less of those sort of client, client meetings face-to-faces. And we found, like in many industries, you went online, the Zoom meeting maybe doesn't have quite the same feel as, as, as a sort of a face-to-face -face meeting. So. But then people sort of just got used, a bit more used to just doing, sort of doing the execution, just doing it to the execution online. But I think there's definitely, it feels to me now that as we're coming out of it, there is a, a want again from both the sort of the, from the buy side and the sell side to again engage in, in those kind of like, you know, meetings, the contact, the uh, building um, that trust. So, so in a way that, I don't think it's changed because of COVID um, at, at all, by the, by the way. Um, I'd say COVID was just very good for sort of building up to seeing how robust the systems were. So things like, you know, remote, you know, sort of remote offices and remote work, working from home, um, you know, like other industries, tra you know, traders across the city, um, you know, had to work, you know, work from home and the systems had to be up to scratch. Um, yeah, so that was a technology challenge in itself, wasn't it? Just making sure that you know you didn't compromise security that you were able to work from a home on a device that was providing you with the same level of security you had in the in your office environment i mean you're trading like you know hundreds of millions you know billions of, of, of bonds yeah and it's like yeah it has to be yeah, it has to be smooth and you know my my experience and also the experience i heard from um you know people who who who, who, who are industries that actually as an industry we did very well at being able to do that in a very safe way now, do I think that after COVID, there's going to be some elements of actually some of this stuff can be done still remotely? Um, probably, yes, of course. Um, yeah, but I think in terms of the actual market itself and the trading within the market, um, honestly, nothing's really changed. Change. I mean, the, it's, it's a, you know, what, what we did see is during, during the crisis, when liquidity did drop a bit, our market probably fared much better than people thought. Like things did trade. Maybe there was a period of a very short period of time where it was it became really, really liquid, for for sure. But it was it, it was a short a short amount of time. 
Um, but, you know, our, our market did continue to trade. The bid offers widened, of course, to reflect the added volatility of the market, but it traded and, you know, ETFs, they traded. You know, yeah. big discounts, but they did trade. And, and I think you also pointed out there was a, a, a big flood of paper because a lot of companies being forced to borrow uh, even during the COVID pandemic, because that's when they needed the liquidity somehow. Um, so you actually had more paper coming on the market and governments, of course, borrowing at a very, very heavy rate. I know we're not talking here about government securities, but mm. the effect of that inflationary paper issuing by the governments filters through into the corporate market, I'm sure, in terms of you see corporate yields starting to rise as inflation looks like it's bubbling up. Yeah, I'd say that definitely there was um, there was uh, there was there was, there was uh, difficult to borrow paper, uh, but borrow bonds in in March last year, as you can imagine. Um, and then when the central bank stepped in um, and calmed the markets in April, then you just had a huge amount of issuance. So so you, so last year, yes, you know you're you're hitting records in terms of amount of debt issued for corporates, absolutely. And so is that going to continue? I honestly think yes. I mean, I think I think yes for a short time. I mean, we've had we've had less issuance. Uh, this year, that's not too surprising, but still, it's um, you know, I, I until things totally normalize. I mean, companies have to obviously fund uh, yeah, a little bit the shortfalls, uh, the, the sort of capex it, that will affect different sectors. Um, look, we're not really talking here necessarily about government debt and sort of you know, inflation views and inflation, and the rest of that. If anything, if, if, if you look recently, the US Treasury um, is, is now is trading back at 1.2 percent, I mean, it was trading. Well, like a one fifty five, like not 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 so long ago. So I think it's you know the, the whole debate around inflation and interest rates. I think is a very fascinating one. That will take another hour to sort of go through that. I have my own personal views on it, but it, but I think it's like I think the things I discussed in the talk, like like these are things where we're kind of moving forward. I think COVID itself, it, you know, it's not like I don't think COVID itself, honestly, has had like you know the the impact where people say oh. Like I'll people, oh yeah, people are now a lot of people who are ordering, let's say, groceries online, are now fluid with ordering groceries online. So that's had a change, maybe slightly to how you know groceries may be ordered, or you know. But I, I don't think we've had that, that kind of effect in the corporate bond market. It's still being used in the same way that it was being used before. Okay, good. Thank you. I've got a follow up from the same individual who's asking, what do we think is the Perhaps he's used the word the buzz. I think it's, it's probably a right word around sustainability and green bonds. I mean, are, is this something that's here to stay or is it a bit of a flash in the pan? It's a bit of a fashion or is it something really important <laughs> to change the way we invest? You know? No, I think uh, I, I definitely don't think it's a flash in the pan. And I think you know, ESG, sustainability linked bonds, sustainable bonds, green bonds, transition bonds. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of different... Uh, types of bonds that carry these char characteristics and have sort of, I guess, performance sort of targets, right, which need to be measured, and they've got to hit those targets or those consequences. So, I, I think I think corporations are very serious about this, and investors are very serious about it, and that and, and and absolutely, you know, our, our your clients, you know, customers buy side um, who are raising green funds, right? They they are seeing demand for those funds, you know, and and the market itself. Is, is telling you that, um, you know, that, that, that this is worth something because, um, you know, green bonds trade at a premium to, 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 to non-green bonds. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think it's just buzz. Um, and I, I think, I think that market's going to get bigger and bigger. And I think, you, you know, I think, I think that, you know, obviously you're seeing the obvious, like, you know, sort of, you know, utility companies obviously are going to be the ones you have, you know, maybe some kind of supermarket companies issuing it, but I think you're going to get more and more different companies are going to find ways to issue bonds. You also have, by the way, um, you know, social social bonds too. It's 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 not just it's not just environmental green stuff. Yeah. Casey, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Do I have time for a couple more? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, we do. I suppose okay, yes. <laughs> my, my, this is personal, uh, if I may, Uzoma. Um, I work with a lot of software vendors in my business. Um, obviously, when you get regulatory change, that can drive software vendors to have to adapt their product or whatever. How, how, who do you think are the strongest players in that marketplace and in supporting traders in the in the in the bond markets? And are they are they being fast enough 
to allow you to bring on board all the new developments that you have to with the regulation and the changes? Yeah, that's, the that's, 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 that's a very good question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I'm probably not going <laughs> to name any particular co companies that I think are the best at what they do. What I, but what I would say and is, is, is totally that there is room now for more, for more, more players, I'd say, than, than there were before. So, um, you know, traditionally, as a, so as a dealer, for sure, you know, you will be dealing with, um, you know, and as I, said, as I said before, a lot of the business is RFQ. And, and there are three main RFQ platforms out there right now, right? This is, this is well known. You've got Bloomberg, you've got TradeRev, you've got Market Access, okay? And they all do slightly different things, but those are the, main, those are, those are the RFQ platforms. But, you know, the point that was coming through a little bit in my, my talk was that there's all these other sort of new operators who are either aggregators for sort of matching platforms. There's all lots of little different, like the ecosystem of corporate bonds, um, is no longer just necessarily depends upon just a few big, you know, maybe larger players. I think there's, 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 there's room for others and, and that's why some of these companies have come up and they've been quite successful. Personally, like, I, diff, like, I know from, from when I speak to my to, to clients, you know, there's not, I think in a way, if a company's not good at what it does, it doesn't last long and it goes bankrupt. And, I, and I'll put it, I'll put it as, as I think as, uh, <laughs> as succinctly as that. Um, because it, it is, it's an, ex, it's an, ex, you know, it, it's expensive. It's, um, you know, in a corporate bond world, you said all the compliance, having to change and keep up with the things. It costs money. You need to keep funding. You know, if you're not, if you have a product that people want, and you know, fixed income investors are very choosy, <laughs> very choosy about what they want, then you're not going to last in the game. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it always struck me that it's a very complex subject in many ways once you start talking about securities trading in any f intelligent form and therefore there's a, well a high barrier of entry um therefore i'm i'm wondering if we're actually seeing much fintech development in the corporate bond market i'm rather thinking probably not but you tell me i don't, I don't want to give yeah. you the answer i i mean i i yeah i mean look i'd i'd answer that by saying like some like some of the projects in in the core bond market, some of them have definitely been um, started by either the sell side coming together and doing it, or you know by by the buy side sort of coming together, and or even just a mixture of both. So like I don't know, you define that as fintech. When I think of fintech, I think of someone coming externally, often to, to a market um, and saying, "Hey, I've got this novel idea. Here we go." A lot of I'd say there's just there's a plenty of a pl the we as a participants in this market we want it to function so we can do a lot of it ourselves and you know a lot of uh, a lot of these companies are quite well capitalized so i'd answer that so so that's that's one thing and another thing is that you're right in in, in terms of just um the the cost yeah it's it's um yeah yeah it's it's it's, it's an expensive market of course it's uh, you know to get everything up and get in it's, it, it costs a bit of money. So probably I'd say there's less fintech, maybe in, in my personal opinion, you sort of see, so I'd say less fintech in maybe the way some of the listeners here are thinking of in some other areas, I'd say, of banking, right? You probably see less fintech um, in, in, in this, in this, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me just ask one final one to Casey, if I may, because I wrote it down very early on. And I'm, I'm sure it's one that our audience would want to hear. So I'm looking for a job. I want to be a corporate bond trader. Um, what skill sets would uh, your company be looking for in your next uh, hire? <laughs> I say, look, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great question. But I, I'd say, look, the corporate bond, the corporate bond trader, like the company I work for, it almost doesn't matter. Like a corporate bond trader, from my experience, corporate bond trader has to be someone who is you have you have to have a passion for the financial markets. Like you really, you really, really got to, you really got to sort of demonstrate that, I'd say, and um, really have that. And, that's, and I'd say increasingly now, you also got to show that you have a tech, you know, you have um, a good sort of analytical, sort of a slight technical um, you know, understanding of things. I think this is, I mean, I hope I've got that across. Like maybe back in the old day, I was a bond trader, you could use bits of paper. Um, on phones and scribble and shout things across, but look, that's just not going to cut it. You know, you need to be able, you need to be able to add, you know, your dimension. Better still, maybe you can build your own spreadsheets, your own models, your own whatever. Like, try and find what edge you're going to give as a trader to the corporate market. So, like, you know, 
as, as like, like when you're looking at like, you know, hiring, like, you know, corporate boss page, you're looking at people, you know, who have, who are not afraid of analysis, who are not afraid um, of using technology, who are not afraid, uh, who have a passion, um, you know, for the financial markets, but also just have, I'd say a real passion for, um, you know, taking intelligent risk, taking, taking intelligent risk. You know, let's not move away from the main reason why dealers and banks are still involved in this corporate bond market is because they put their balance sheet to work. Yeah, yeah. You know? And yeah. if you're going to be a corporate bond trader, you're going to have a balance sheet and you're going to have to put that balance sheet to work. So that's you know something that obviously you learn, you'll train and rest about that, but you've got to be someone who's comfortable to take intelligent risk. We, we used to always have a phrase that um, a bank was managing a risk for a profit. That was the key. And so managing your risk and therefore knowing your risk was what you needed to do before you even started. Jacasey, I think with that, we haven't got more questions coming in from the audience uh, and we've reached 7.30. So maybe I'll leave it to you to close up our, our session. Yes. OK. Um, right. That's the end of the Q&A. Uh, thanks to our speaker, Ozawa our Thank audience you, for participating and to the FinSIC committee. So I will see you next time. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.